Welcome and good morning. I'm Robert Pollock. I'm going to be your moderator this morning. Uh, I'm a senior advisor with the Secretariat of the Initiative for Co-Regions in Transition. So welcome to this session entitled Updates from the Secretariat and Voices from the Regions. We've got a lot to get through in the next 90 or so minutes, and I would like to wrap up proceedings around 12.15, so I think we should start our session now. And just for your information, the slides will be available, so no need to take lots of notes this morning, except when the speakers are talking. So just a, a few guidelines before we begin today's session. As you know, we will be using Slido uh, to collate and collect questions. So if you have questions, especially for the panel session later this morning, can I recommend that you use Slido? And don't be shy, you can submit your questions through your telephone, through your mobile phone, through your tablet, through your laptop. So please, the process is firstly, go to slido.com, enter the code CRIT4, that is all uppercase, and submit your question. We'll have the ability to vote on the question submitted, so it makes it a much more dynamic and uh, democratic. So I'm looking forward uh, certainly to using this technology. As you're aware, uh, the, the notes, please note that the meeting will be recorded. Um, and if you have any technical issues, uh, please send a, me a message via the chat to the host, and hopefully we can resolve these. So can I have the next slide, please? As you've heard, I am Robert Pollock. I'm your moderator for this morning. Next slide, please. And we are very much focusing on providing an update of the Secretariat's activities. Uh, we've had a busy few months since we last met as a virtual community. But I'm delighted that this morning is also about hearing different views, perspectives and insights from a range of regions. So uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. For those of you who are not um, regulars or veterans of the CRIT initiative, the Co-Regions in Transition initiative, I just wanted to remind us of the geographic coverage and the scope of the initiative. The initiative obviously covers co-regions across Europe, 31 regions in 11 EU countries. But we now have officially uh, taken on board peat regions in Ireland and Finland and oil, an oil shale region in Estonia. And that we very much welcome that development, given the similarities in the challenges faced by these regions. In terms of this morning's session, there is a very strong emphasis on sharing experience and insights between the EU regions. So we have a varied agenda uh, this morning covering issues such as observations, reflections, considerations and insights on policy and practice and networking collaboration. Very topical issues. How do we improve our policy and our practice in terms of transition in the CRIT regions. And there's also going to be insights on developing networks and collaboration across regions. Our second purpose of this morning is to bring differing regional voices to the table. And I'm delighted to say that we have nine contributors this morning from across the European Union. And they're representing different sectors, such as government, research, NGOs, and representative bodies. So before I hand over to my colleague, Paul Baker, who's going to give an update on STAR, I would like to say that a lot of work has been progressed by the initiative in recent weeks. And I think there are more significant aspects to our program that will emerge in the coming months. As you have heard in recent days, the initiative 
uh, for coal regions in transition in the Western Balkans and the Ukraine it is beginning to gather momentum. And I think that is an initiative that will have close synergies with our own initiative. And we look forward to taking forward um, those synergies in the coming weeks and months. As we've also heard, twinning and exchange programs are going to be significant, and we're already seeing the where we're beginning to develop relationships between start regions such as Asturias and Spain, and I'm sure we will be working more on twinning and exchange programs in the coming months. Also, we will be further developing our material and Next slide, please. As you're aware, we have the the Secretariat over the last few months, over the last year, has developed quite a sophisticated suite of support materials are now being The experts for a wide range of themes. Sustainable employment, environmental rehabilitation. And in the coming months, we will also be developing toolkits on future technology options for coal regions, looking at how assets within coal regions can be inverted for energy transition and economic diversification. And we will also be developing a toolkit on financial instruments for coal regions in transition. And obviously that will be further developed when we've got greater clarity on the MFA and other. I'd also like to remind you that we also have a suite of case studies on transition across a varied grouping of different types of regions, and you may want to uh, consider uh, the experiences of other regions, and I would suggest that you look at these case studies, and we also have a range of profiles of different types of regions that are receiving technical assistance. Now, all these materials are available on our website, and the web link is identified at the top of the slide. If we could have the next slide, please. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to the webinars that are available. Uh, we have a, a range of webinars. Um, we are developing two more webinars that will be available in 21 on technology options, which is financial We also have webinars relating to existing uh, toolkits, the transition strategies and governance, sustainable employment, and environmental rehabilitation. And if you've not looked at these uh, webinars, I would very much encourage you to do so. It's, it's a very nice way of understanding the subject in a summarized and engaging fashion. For those of you who have not subscribed to the newsletter, can I suggest that you subscribe to the Secretariat newsletter as it will give you an insight to the oil transition across European regions. Also, a range of interviews by planners and policymakers in regard to the uh, process of transition. So, just before I hand you over to my colleague Paul, I think. Last year. For the last uh, three very flying ahead, but we have got good foundations, and as ever, we look forward to working with the regions across the Europe, across Europe, to make transition a success. So, just to give further insight into one aspect of the Secretariat's work, the technical assistance program known as Start, I will now hand over to Paul. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
um, Paul Baker. Uh, along with Robert, I'm one of the advisors to the Secretariat of the Initiative for Coal Regions in Transition. And uh, this morning, I'd just like to give an update on where we are in terms of the activities of START. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so, START is the uh, Secretariat Technical Assistance to Regions in Transition. Um, for those who are not familiar with uh, this, we started uh, the process of START in the summer of 2019, where there was an open call for requests for technical assistance. Um, and in October last year, seven regions were selected for support. I will come on to the regions uh, in a moment. Um, and we began uh, at the end of last year with uh, initial site visits to, to the regions. Uh, by March of this year, we had completed five regional visits. Um, and then, unfortunately, as everyone will be aware, uh, uh, COVID-19 struck. Uh, and so we have been doing a lot to actually revise the delivery of technical assistance. Um, and we are progressing now uh, in a kind of virtual technical assistance mode. Uh, we will continue to deliver support under the, the START program until the end of 2021. Um, in terms of uh, the resources and the activities of, SCAR, uh, of START, um, the idea is that this should be uh, technical assistance uh, looking at uh, strategy development, governance issues, um, project identification and project selection and development, working with uh, local administrations, and intended to be complementary to other support activities, particularly to complement other EU funded technical assistance delivery in the regions. Uh, and we provide around 50 to, to 100 days of, of technical support to, to each region. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the seven regions that we are covering are shown on the on, on the map. Um, very varied in in terms of the characteristics of the of the regions and uh, in terms of the the status of their their development of transition away from coal. Um, and as you can see from from the the regions that are shown there. Uh, Quite different in terms of the the technical assistance uh, requests that we received. Um, some very much focused on on strategy uh, activities, strategy support for strategy development. Others much more on the issues of uh, project development, project identification. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what I would like to do uh, is just to update you on where we are with each of the regions that we are working with. Um, and I give a particular focus today um, to the Midlands region in Ireland um, because we it was one of the first regions that we started working with at the at the end of last year, and we completed I think quite successfully uh, our technical assistance support to to the region uh, a month ago. Um, so we signed off in in, in September on on that. Um, so our support was to the Midlands Regional um, Transition Team, uh, which has been working on uh, developing a, a program of identification of uh, projects in the Midlands region in Ireland. Um, as you'll be aware, this is a, a peat region, not a, not a coal region, uh, and it's also a very rural uh, region. Um, very quickly, uh, we worked with them on an engagement process um, and all of the materials that, that uh, we provided are, to them are available through um, the uh, Secretariat web pages. But I think, and, and it's very useful to see also how we managed to progress uh, in a time of COVID in terms of engaging with uh, rural communities um and uh interacting with them in terms of informing them of what activities were going on uh, and also in terms of uh, getting them to put forward uh project ideas um we had an open call for for projects with uh, 150 more than 150 projects um that were submitted to the midlands regional transition team next slide please 
We also worked with them on some thematic issues, particularly looking at in employment and skills, and we provided a, a report on, on guidance uh, and good practice for uh, supporting workers. Um, again, uh, taking into account the very rural environment there in, in the regions. And we also worked with them on what we've called the pathway to transition, which is a document um, not so much as a, a strategy document, but more as a document that can help them to set out a, a pathway of activities uh, that need to be um, done in terms of the, the taking forward their transition activities. So building consensus also in terms of uh, the resources that they have allocated and, and the coordination of activities across different uh, actors within the region. And also in terms of uh, supporting transparency of the, of the, the transition uh, process and of course in monitoring and progress. So those, those um, documents are all uh, available as I already mentioned and, and, and worth uh, taking, taking a look for those that are interested. Next slide. Um, Carla Vivari in the Czech Republic, uh, we are working with them. Uh, we have a number of uh, areas that are in progress, um, in particular with three thematic areas that we are working with on the region. One is, is looking at good practice for regional transition strategies um, and working with them in trying to identify ideas, international experience and ideas on, on the formulation of transition strategies. We're also looking at uh, employment creation and skills requirements we have already completed uh, a draft report there on, on short term skill needs um, for workers who will be laid off from the lignite mining and power generation activities. And we're also beginning to work with the region in terms of a initial review of uh, renewable energy options uh, and also looking at um, uh, improvements in energy efficiency as well as part of the uh, the, the strategy um, for improving energy uh, efficiency and the switch to renewable energies. Uh, this work is ongoing um, and the idea is these will be inputs also for uh, the next step which will be a, a review of uh, current and unplanned strategy development in the in the region um, and also looking at developing an action plan um, particularly for the sub-region uh, within Karla Vivari, the sub-region of Sokolov, uh, which is where the majority of the, oh, in fact, all of the, the lignite mining and power gener generation activities are located. Next slide, please. We're also working with the Asturias region in Spain. Um, and there again, in terms of the work that we're doing that is in progress at the moment, uh, we have, um, the region there has, has under, undertaken a lot of work in terms of analysis of energy uh, requirements and energy um, options for the future of the region, um, bearing in mind the uh, phasing out now of, of coal and coal fired uh, power generation. Um, so we've been helping them in terms of uh, formulation of a strategy and logic for, for an energy strategy, um, but also looking at how uh, some of the options that they're considering are aligned to EU uh, technological and, and policy priorities. And we'll also be looking um, at good practice and innovative strategy developments elsewhere. And in that line of thinking, we are also, I think Robert mentioned this earlier, looking at opportunities for uh, regional collaboration and, and sort of twinning activities. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're in discussion also with uh, Silesia on a possible um, cooperation and collaboration between the two regions, between Asturias and Silesia in, in, in Poland. Um, the other area of work is on, on project selection. We're looking with them in terms of a methodology for, for project uh, selection and validation. And going forward, uh, once we complete the strategy work, we will also be working them on assessing and, and presentation and development of uh, uh, projects, transition projects in the region. Next slide, please. 
We've also begun our work in Malopolska in, in Poland. We are working there with the, the marshal's office. Um, the initial work on there will be a review of a number of transition projects that have been proposed uh, primarily in the western part of the region. Um, so we're looking there again, similarly with, with, with Asturias in looking at uh, project uh, selection and, and prioritization criteria and also similarly looking at the alignment of the projects that they have in their inventory of projects in terms of alignment with uh, EU transition um, policy and energy policy priorities. Um, again, with a, looking at that, but also in, in consideration of what uh, funding opportunities may be available for, for different uh, projects. Um, we will, or the intention is that we will take forward a number of those projects, a few of them, uh, probably three or four projects and develop roadmaps for each of those projects um, in terms of the activities that need to be done in terms of taking, in some cases, um, fairly well developed projects, in other cases, relatively early stage projects through to um, uh, a situation in which they can be uh, um, presented for, for funding and, and in terms of uh, further, further development of each of the projects. Next slide. As mentioned, um, uh, we uh, we we were in. Uh, obviously, uh, the COVID nineteen impacted on our activities. We have two regions: the Jew Valley in Romania and Silesia in Poland, in which we didn't manage to uh, undertake our initial um, site visits. So we're now looking with them both regions. We will be hopefully discussing where we already plan to discuss in the, in the coming weeks um, in terms of a review of what their technical assistance needs are. Um, and the intention is that for each of these two regions, we will come forward with a, with a work plan of, of activities, um, which will reflect the changes that have taken place in the region over the last year since, um, since uh, the initial application for support was made. But also taking into account uh, that uh, you know we are, will have to deliver much of this support via a, a virtual means rather than um, by being on the ground. Um, but our our plan is, and I, I'm sure it will happen, that we will uh, have defined a work plan with each of these regions before the end of December 2020. Um, and finally, I need to to mention Megalopoly in in the Peloponnese in in Greece. Um, we did uh, manage a site visit there um, at the beginning of this year. Um, and at the moment, we are actually waiting to see what the outcome of the national level master plan for, for just transition, um, what the implications of that will be for um, the region, in particular, the municipality of, of Megalopoly, and with the intention that we will then um, go back and, and Talk through with the with the with the local um, counterparts what their um, requirements are for for technical assistance support um, through taking us through uh, next year. So that's a very quick um, summary of where we are on each of the the regions. And at this point, I like to to hand you back to to Robert, who will take the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for that update on start. Um, that effectively concludes the update from the Secretariat, but I hope it gives you an insight into the developments that have occurred since we last met as a community. But we now turn to the second part of this morning, and that's the voices from the regions. And this is the most important part of this morning, because the initiative has always been about facilitating and enabling different perspectives, different insights about the process of transition from across Europe. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome some familiar faces to this morning's event to discuss a trilateral cooperation program between regions in the Czech Republic, Germany and Poland. And I must say it's a very timely intervention. Uh, as we've heard over the last few days, twinning and exchange programs will become a more significant dimension of the transition process at the European regional level. And that will be twinning and exchange programs very much focused on improving and enhancing 
policy and practice. And this morning we have three experts who are going to give some insights into the benefits and lessons learned in regard to their trilateral co cooperation. So I'm delighted that we have Carol Tietje. Um, many of us know Carol well. Uh, he is with the Economic and Social Council of the Usti region in Czechia. We have Katja Muller, uh, again, somebody who we know well, uh, many of us in the initiative, uh, and Katja is with the Europstat Gorlich Gorlich for Economic Development in, in Germany. And we also have Alexandra Jabaya from the Marshal's Office of Lower Silesia. Now, they've got quite a, an ambitious uh, presentation, and I think they're going to cover it in 15 minutes. So, uh, Ali will hand the floor over to Carol, who they will then hand over to Alexandra and Katja. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to greet you all uh, on behalf of the Economic and Social Council of the uh, Usti region. Some of you may remind me from my previous position under the Restart program uh, related to the Ministry of Regional Development of Czech Republic. Nevertheless, uh, on the beginning, I'd like to thank to the European Commission and the Secretariat uh, to be able to, let's say, give you some overview of the activities we have uh, implemented in previous months uh, in direct cooperation and coordination in their support. Uh, I will ask Philip for the next slide. When we are talking about trilateral cooperation, we are talking especially about cooperation of co-regions from Czech Republic, Germany and Poland. These are three, uh, let's say, countries uh, which uh, will be mostly affected uh, uh, by the transition and uh, transformation processes. Uh, the fourth uh, is Romania, as we all know. Uh, why to cooperate? Uh, we are definitely sure that uh, these uh, regions in uh, Poland, Germany and Czech Republic uh, are regions with common history, common problems and challenges ahead. Uh, and so we do express our willingness to uh, support common development and uh, common development of major projects which can help the whole transition process. Uh, of course, uh, one of the most important aspects is also the geographical proximity of these regions, uh, which help us a lot uh, in the coordination and uh, communication, uh, despite uh, the uh, COVID situation. Philip, next slide, please. On this slide, I would like to thank once more to the DGNR, which will have, which has helped us a lot last year in October uh, during uh, the last physical meeting uh, of the Co Regions in Transition Platform, uh, which has uh, let's say supported uh, our cooperation and uh, uh, pushed us a bit uh, into 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 it, and I'm very happy for it. I can say. Uh, after this uh, initial communication in October last year, we have um, met uh, in uh, November in Dresden, and uh, we have agreed some common agreed some common let's say areas for cooperation. Uh, and as already um, Robert uh, has mentioned, these are especially related with uh, twinning activities, uh, information and data sharing, and of course, uh, development of common projects. Uh, I can say that, uh, of course, uh, our cooperation in the last uh, months was uh, hit by the COVID situation, but uh, we are still moving forward. Next slide, please, Philip. Here are, let's say, two most important uh, fields uh, which uh, the regional representatives have agreed uh, to work together and uh, which they have agreed as the most important uh, for common cooperation and coordination. Uh, the first one, revitalization of coal mine sites for further utilization, is related especially with uh, our goal to bring these areas back to life, back to the citizens uh, and back to further economic uh, exploitation. E.g. Uh, building of uh, pumped storage water plants there, uh, develop the hydro cultivation uh, with installing the floating solar panels and so on. Uh, 
The second important part of our cooperation is uh, the development of alternative energy resources and, of course, securing the energy security, which we uh, count as one of the most important part as the whole of the whole transition process. Uh, on this uh, level, we have uh, discussed especially our goal to develop common uh, projects related to hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. On this next slide, you can see uh, some of the other uh, areas of cooperation agreed. I will just pinpoint uh, or let's say emphasize uh, the goal to support each other also in order part of the transition process. And uh, that means that we will try to cooperate also on the level of development of common projects related to education uh, and especially education uh, related to the concept of Industry 4.0. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, a beautiful picture of us uh, from our common meeting in Dresden in November 2000. Beautiful to be able to meet together physically. Hope we'll be here back soon. Uh, so just to give you uh, some uh, view into it. Uh, next slide, please. And afterwards, so we have also chance to meet during the annual political meeting in Genlitz uh, and a related working uh, a workshop in Tita uh, when uh, we have discussed in a let's say a bit broader scope of partners uh, with uh, also uh, presented uh, partners from Spain, uh, Greece and so on, uh, how the cooperation of co-regions and empowering of each other is really important. And uh, here I can say that I'm really looking forward for uh, the new Erasmus concept for uh, co-regions, which was introduced uh, uh, during this week uh, in the virtual, uh, virtual meeting. So I think this new program uh, will be re really helpful for us in our sharing uh, and uh, let's say, let's say data exchange. Next slide, please. On this slide, I would like to uh, present you one of the example of the project developed in the interregional cooperation with our partners from Poland and Germany. That's a newly uh, proposed project, Live Water Solar, uh, which is related to the, to the development of uh, clean energy uh, project on the field of previous uh, mine area. Uh, I have to stress that uh, the Live Water Solar is a demonstration project uh, because we hope that uh, this uh, demonstration will help us to learn that uh, it is possible to replicate uh, its uh, approach related with the installation of uh, well floating uh, solar panels on the hydrogen cultivation sites in much more broader scale on uh, future large hydrogen cultivation sites in Czech Republic, uh, possible also in uh, Germany, of course. Uh, on the next slide, uh, and that will be for, for a while, the last slide, from my side, you can see the area uh, in which the demonstration project uh, Live Water Cellar should be implemented. Uh, you see the red uh, red line um, on the bottom. That's the Live Water Cellar test field, uh, which is about 1.6 km square kilometers. Uh, on the other hand, the blue part, uh, that's the possible uh, and one of the most important replication sites. That's the future lake called Center uh, on uh, the current coal mine open pit uh, uh, in the Ustie region of Czech Republic, which has about 14, for, for 15 square kilometers. You can, you can uh, see that um, the possibility and uh, let's say the look for the replication is really huge. So that was uh, inputs from my side, and now I'm very happy to be able to hand the word to Katya, which will introduce you some of the examples of the projects from Germany and Poland. So thank you, Kara, for handing me the floor. So uh, this close cooperation, as you just heard, uh, has led to a couple of uh, project ideas. And 
we are kind of working together, like uh, also in this situation, although we had to cancel the meeting. And I was asked to present my project, uh, which is one in the city uh, of Görlitz and Skorlitz, where we briefly during the next few minutes, and I am uh, on behalf of the city municipality and the district heating company of uh, Görlitz and Skorlitz, which is a town, as you know, probably, uh, but right in, on the border of uh, Germany and Poland. So, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> uh, we agreed to make the European Green Deal happen with a common European pilot project. The aim is to reach climate neutral uh, neutrality and strengthen the ambitions with a cross border climate neutral district heating uh, for both parts of the city. The idea is to supply the climate neutral heating in both parts with a common generation site in Poland. And it is a cooperation with a symbolic character for the Europe city and for whole Europe. Two countries working hand in hand together uh, to supply climate neutral heating for, for the citizen. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a strong political willingness to work together on connecting Europe by operating issues in the Green Deal. Therefore, a letter was signed uh, by the mayors of Görlitz and Skorlitz and the district heating companies in July. And we are strongly supported by the government of the free state of Saxony. And so if we move to the next slide, please. Um, what do we need this uh, political support for? Uh, as you can see on this slide, for this project, we need, it is necessary to use invest an amount of cost and uh, for this uh, project can only be realized with a strong subsidy in order to achieve an acceptable price level to ensure local acceptance of Green Deal project throughout citizens and the companies and the entities around. So if we move to the next slide, this, this is an, uh, in addition to this climate neutral supply, we try to uh, offer a closer connection by combining the technical requirements of the district heating into the new traffic bridge between uh, the, uh, the both part of the city across the Nysa River, which is uh, dividing the, the city into two parts. And this bridge would bring people even closer and brings the traffic out of the historical centers and is also likely to improve the air and life quality in both parts of the European city. And uh, so with your support and the support of the European Union and uh, the one of these trilateral cooperation in which we work very closely together, we will be able to contribute on delivering an overall Green Deal pilot project for this region. And uh, so, yeah, this trilateral cooperation works out and we keep working together in this training process. And so I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, kindly hand over to my colleague Alexander Svaya from Marshall Office of Lower Silesia to present another project which was developed in this working group. Uh, thank you, Katya. Good morning, everyone. Um, maybe I'll go straight to my topic. Um, transformation and mining topics required a great deal of understanding and uh, information trans transfer. Uh, this subject in the Lower Silesia Saxony border are faces uh, challenges in the field of economy, uh, energy policy, and uh, environmental protection and revitalization. Therefore, one of the priority issue is improvement and strengthening cross border cooperation uh, between the counterparts mining institution on both sides. Uh, as an example of this kind of action, I would like to show you briefly the Mine, Mine Life project, uh, which was based of, uh, on uh, knowledge and experience uh, exchange. Uh, we finished this project at the beginning of uh, 2020. During three years operation, uh, three partners took uh, part in the project, uh, which you can see on the slide. Uh, they are mining institutions which daily deal with, uh, of course, among others, uh, licensing processes or controlling uh, mining plants. Uh, we also invited enterprises and the local authorities to uh, cooperate. Next slide, please. Our cooperation has been uh, divided into three pillars. Uh, first of all, 
um, joint competency development. Uh, among this task, we organized two mining conferences. Moreover, what turned out to be the most important, we organized uh, study trips to mining enterprises, active and former. Uh, it allowed us to verify our theory with practice. Uh, each of partners also wrote several industry art articles about mining, Polish representatives for German magazines and vice versa. Another problem in both regions are conflicts between mining companies and the local people. Therefore, we have also focused uh, largely on the development and application of a conflict management strategy. Uh, we analyzed specific life cases. As a result of this work, we also created shared publication in two languages about that issue. Uh, there is also a deficit of information on mining and revitalization among the public on both sides of, of the border. Hence, our informational uh, activities in the last pillar, uh, such as uh, guest lecturers or uh, uh, traveling exhibition. Personally, I think that this kind of projects show, first of all, how little we know about our neighbors, but also show similar and most of all common problems and challenges. Meeting within such project of, uh, offer enormous opportunities to solve our uh, doubts and difficulties together. Uh, and I'm sure that this cooperation will not end there and we are looking forward for another possibilities of joint cross-border projects within our new partners for triathlon uh, working group. Um, that's all from my side and uh, Carol, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Alexandra. Also, thank you, Katya. I know that I'm, we are a bit running out of time, but uh, I think that even this, uh, our common, our, our, our presentation of common uh, really, uh, let's say, confirm uh, how uh, we are used to cooperate with our partners from Poland and Germany, and I'm really, really happy for it. I have to say that, uh, of course, our cooperation has been also influenced by the pandemic situation, but um, this uh, um, doesn't didn't change anything on our effort. We are still in touch. Um, we have been planning a large interregional meeting uh, in Ustie region. Obviously, this uh, didn't happen, but uh, we hope that uh, within months we'll be able to implement uh, and let's say further develop our common activities related, especially as have been already mentioned, to the development of, of common project uh, discussion related to the JTF regulation and the TJTPs, which, uh, as I think, are of the crucial importance for all of you in these days. And uh, we will be happy to implement further twinning actions and do not hesitate to join us uh, and contact us if you are if you are interested in it. Uh, I can now see some uh, slideos uh, questions already now. So, Robert, uh, if you just give me a hint, if I should uh, answer them now or later on. And uh, from my side, that's all for now. And thank you very much for your attention. Carol, thank you. I think. In the interests of keeping to the time of the programme, I think we'll take questions at the end in regard to um, the panel discussion. And if there are questions specific to your cooperation programme, we, we will certainly bring you in. Um, but before handing over uh, to the, 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 the panellists, I just want to thank you for, for what it was an inspiring presentation. Uh, I really appreciated the insights of yourself, Katja, and Alexandra, um, and the lessons that we can learn for future cooperation and networking. And as you said, we are now looking at the development of future exchange programs uh, along the lines of the Erasmus concept that was spoken of a number of days ago. And I'm really pleased that the initiative can be an enabling mechanism for such cooperation. And as you say, these are challenging times. We are trying to develop and maintain our cooperation in a virtual sense, but hopefully come the new year 2021, we will return to much more physical and face-to-face -face networking. But thank you for that inspiring presentation. If we could have the, the next slide, please. Uh, we, we are now uh, going to be spending some time thinking about regional success stories. 
and good practice. And I'm delighted that we have an excellent panel to discuss success and good practice, but also consider what are the principles that, under, that underpin success in the process of transition. But we should also take time to consider what are the barriers that inhibit successful delivery. And I'm sure many of these issues will be explored by our panelists. Um, you know, just on a more philosophical point, it's worth, you know, bearing in mind that success is quite a subjective notion and one that is conditional on policy priorities. So success when considered in a just transition perspective, which we are all now pursuing, the need to achieve just transition, success in a just transition context can look somewhat different from, agenda, from an, an agenda, a policy agenda centered on GDP growth in isolation to economic growth in isolation. But as I say, I'm delighted that we have a, an excellent panel today. Uh, we firstly have um, Professor Steve Fothergill and Ilika Circle, and they will be giving a more longitudinal perspective of the process of transition. Uh, Steve will be thinking of transition in the context of the UK, coal transition in the UK that's occurred over many decades. And the same is true of Ilka, who will be thinking of transition in the longitudinal uh, perspective, but in, in her case, in terms of North Rhine-Westphalia. We will then be handing over to Zednik, who will be giving a, an insight into the process of transition in Moravia, Silesia. And then we will be handing over to Dimitris, who will give a more uh, enriched insight into the role of civil society in the process of transition in Greece, very much uh, from the WWF perspective. So just before handing over to Steve, who will give his insights, I'd like to have a few words uh, on Steve. Um, Steve is a professor in the Centre for Regional Economic and Social Research at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. And he has, for more than 30 years, played a central role in the regeneration of former coal mining areas in his capacity as National Director of the Local Authority Association, representing UK mining and other old industrial areas. So Steve has a wealth of knowledge um, in terms of the process of transition over a number of decades. So Steve, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Robert, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, let me just kick off by picking on that word um, success, success stories. Um, in the UK context, um, I'm certainly uncomfortable with that because I wouldn't actually um, describe the UK experience as being a success story. Uh, we've made progress in coalfield regeneration. Um, but we've also encountered many, many problems and still do have many problems um, still to resolve. Now, a word or two by way of background on the, on the UK context, which not everybody um, will be familiar with. Um, at its peak, the UK coal industry employed 1.1 million people. Let me just repeat that, 1.1 million people who worked in the coal industry. Um, the industry produced 290 million tonnes of coal a year from 3,000 mines. So I would put it to you that the UK probably has more experience um, of uh, the transition away from the production and use of coal than anywhere else on the planet. That's a vast amount of experience accumulated over many, many decades. Um, that peak production was actually 100 years ago. Uh, but even in the early 1980s, we still had almost a quarter of a million uh, miners. Uh, but the last deep coal mine closed in the United Kingdom uh, in December of 2015. That big rundown of the coal industry had little or nothing to do with the green agenda. It was primarily driven by uh, technical change, uh, by commercial pressures, especially in the electricity generation sector, and also by uh, competition uh, from imported uh, coal. Now, most of the UK uh, coal mining took place in uh, deep mines, 
uh, rather than uh, open cast mines. Those deep mines were surrounded by um, large and stable uh, communities. And I've got to say that though there are a lot of lessons uh, that can be learned from the UK experience, I'm a little bit more sceptical as to how much the UK experience can be um, read across to uh, how to deal with the problems of lignite and peat mining areas where the, uh, the context seems to me to be um, quite different. Anyway, that's, that, that's the background. Uh, what I wanted to do in the very brief time available to me is, is just to set out um, six major lessons uh, from the UK experience of, of moving away from coal and trying to transition the economy of the regions. The first lesson is that I would be surprised uh, if you didn't encounter resistance from the workforce to the loss of their jobs. Um, that was certainly the case in, in the United Kingdom. Indeed, uh, in the UK, we had a year-long miners' strike in the 1980s uh, that was specifically called to oppose uh, coal mining closures. Uh, the miners lost, ultimately lost that dispute, but it was the biggest industrial dispute uh, in the United Kingdom in any industry, uh, probably um, since the Second World War, almost certainly the biggest uh, dispute of any kind uh, since the Second World War, uh, a major social and economic and political uh, event in UK history. Uh, second lesson from the UK experience is that redundancies can be managed sensitively. Now, in practice, actually, uh, in the UK, we did not always manage uh, the redundancies of coal miners very sensitively. Um, but there was at least one aspect of the UK experience um, which was quite successful. Uh, and that was that because we had um, a state-owned coal industry that was not all closed down at one point in time, but closed down progressively over many, many years, what the industry was able to do was to call for redundancies across all of the mines, and, but then actually keep on the men who, will, who wanted to stay on in the industry whose mines were closing. By, the industry kept them by transferring them across to mines that continued to operate. Now, the effect of that policy over many, many years meant that the people who left, the miners who left the industry, uh, were typically the, the older men, um, the men uh, sometimes with health problems, the men who wanted to leave the industry, or those, for example, who had high levels of skills who were confident they could find other work out there in the economy. Um, whereas those who stayed within the industry or wanted to stay within the industry were able uh, to do so. That was a very successful policy, I've got to say, for several decades. It finally broke down, of course, as the number of mines uh, really became very, very small. Third lesson from the UK experience is that the main problem is not actually what happens to the redundant miners, though that is a big problem. It's what happens to the generations behind them. After a while, the redundant miners themselves find other work, drop out of the labour market, or, or simply reach the pension age. But when you're closing down an industry of the scale of the UK coal industry, it leads a huge hole in local economies. And the big question then is, well, what do the generations behind uh, the miners actually do for work? Uh, where can they find uh, employment? And that has been the big ongoing challenge. It's not the re-employment of the miners, it's finding work for the generations uh, behind the miners, their sons and daughters. Fourth lesson from the uh, UK experience, uh, progress, successful progress requires action on a broad front. If you think that there is a single silver bullet, a single great policy which you can pursue and everything will be all right, think again, that's not correct. You need to work uh, in a sustained way on many, many issues uh, simultaneously and sometimes actually uh, in sequence. You need investment in, in road networks. You need, need investment in site reclamation and property development. Uh, you need investment in training and skills. And you need the financial support for businesses to make it worthwhile to develop and grow in the former mining areas. 
fifth lesson from the UK experience, geographical context matters. Um, some of the former mining areas in Britain have regenerated much more successfully than others. Typically, it's been easier to achieve regeneration uh, in areas that are centrally located in the United Kingdom, ringed by motorway networks with acres of potential uh, flatland for development. Um, it's more problematic uh, in the more remote and peripheral areas, poorly connected uh, to other parts of the country and other parts um, of the economy. And um, sixth and final lesson from the UK experience, regeneration of former mining areas is the work of more than a generation. It isn't a job that can be undertaken and completed quickly. Indeed, in the UK, we started on this task as far back as the 1930s. And the efforts have been sustained to various extents right the way uh, since the Second World War. Um, there is evidence of progress. There's no question of that. We can point to new jobs, new industries, um, rising employment opportunities, reductions in unemployment. But also, if you crawl over the numbers, we can also still point to major social and economic problems that still persist in some, if not necessarily all, of the former mining areas of the United Kingdom. So, six points there. Watch out, there may be resistance from the workforce. Try to manage the redundancies sensitively. Um, the main problem is uh, the employment of the generations behind the ex-miners. Progress is possible, but needs to go on a broad front. The geographical context, context matters, and for better or worse, uh, this is the work of several generations. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Really useful, powerful insights, given the experience you have had of tracking a uh, transition over the long term. And I'm very struck by your comment. There are no silver bullets here. You know, change is multi-causal, change is multi-dimensional. And I thought your point about, you know, spatial and temporal awareness was very powerful. Different localities have different opportunities, and therefore there needs to be different policy responses. And I think your temporal um, message is a very powerful one. Transition, as we all know, is no sprint. It is very much a hard marathon. So thank you for those very valuable insights. I, I would now like to hand over to Ilka Circle. And Ilka works for the Department of European and Regional Networks for the Ruhr, North Rhine Westphalia. Ilka has a career in regional development spanning over 20 years. And that has been very much in relation to diversification and transition, both in the German region of Saxony Anhalt, which many of us know as a lignite region. But since 2004, she's been heavily involved in the transition process in the Ruhr. So please, Ilka, you, you have the floor. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Ilka Circle from the Ruhr region. Next slide, please, Philip. I was asked to uh, present our project by side contract Ruhr as a uh, instrument for governancing of transition. Could you just switch the slide? Thank you very much. As a new form of cooperation, but as I said, as an instrument for governance of transition. So. It's about 20 sites in the contract, the total surface of about 1,000 hectares, and it funds the exemplary sustainable development of former mining sites with a priority, with our partners, and with the regional relevance. So the partners are the state of North Rhine Westphalia, the mining company, the cities, the sites are located in, and we as the regional association, we are moderating this process. How it came to that. Next slide, please. We in Germany had the very lucky situation that we could anticipate political decisions. The region made a strategic agreement in a consensual way for the urban development 
uh, regarding the next EU funding period in 2007. And that was very lucky because when the federal government of Germany made the decision to end up subsidizing hardcore coast in Germany in 2018, we could see that coming. We had a 10 year, pro, um, a 10 year process that we had the chance to design. So when the federal decision was made in 2008, the region could get on the regional agreement from 2007, anticipating that and make again a regional concept that was more focused on the mining sites. So there were three fields of action that was education, city and climate. Everyone has his own product or his own project. And um, that what I what I want to stress out is that the mining site contract is just one part of the regional agreement. And as Steve already said, um, you have to develop integrating. So it took another six years to come from the regional agreement to the contract. And I try to explain what we did in that six years. Next slide, please. So one of our lessons learned is trying to act concurrently in the regional strategic scale and as well in the local operational scale, in the project scale. And that was the hardest part of the six years coming to the contract to have a proof of all mining sites. Some were closing before, some were closed just in the end of 2018. To come to a selection of the 20 site that could be developed sustainable in an exemplary way. So that's the mining site contract for. Uh, um, we tried to um, agree with all the partners, a consensual catalog of quality criteria you can see listed in the green box below. But I need to point out that at the beginning in 2014, it has been just a forecast. It has been just an expectation that the selected sites will someday fulfill this quality criteria. So it was very important to come up with convincing idea and that were hard negotiation, <laughs> you can trust me, um, to come to the selection of the um, 20 sites. But if you do this, you have to do at the same time the balance act um, to precise to precisely select it because um, you have to respect the site. You have to respect the history of the site, the people live nearby. And as Steve already said, that you have to create individual perspective for the upcoming generation. Next slide, please. So we took time for creating a common understanding between all the different uh, partners and one of our advices is to start informally. We started with an alliance of the willing swan and we got formal much more later, six years later. And all the time we were addressing our um, action to all political levels, to the European Commission, to the federal government of Germany, and also to the state government of North Rhine Westphalia. Next slide, please. We still do communication every day continuously. We have a steering committee that meets once a year and uh, reporting all the um, sites, the, the progress and the development of the sites of the 21s. But if there were the decision makers from all the partners in the steering group, we have we have the chance to address obstacles and find solutions to overcome it. And as we do that for every site every year, at this year we started a research project to evaluating the mining site contract itself as an instrument, as a new form of corporations. We are sharing our experience of not only in co-regions that we did before, we have a uh, interregional cooperation with our Polish partner, GZM, and we will house the um, Geo Valley colleagues from Romania at the end of November. Um, uh, and what we, what we also do is wherever we can, we put a spotlight out on our sites and our projects and our regions. And I just listed here the opportunities the European Commission gave to benefit the capital culture or has very much to do with our industrial um, industry, with our industrial culture. The European Green Capital in 2007, of course, has much to do with revitalization of mining sites. One of our projects was 
finalist at Regio Star Awards and the next big event coming up dealing with our sites and our mining history is the International Garden Exhibition in 2027. Next slide, please, Philip. Some more closing remarks um, more generally is that, of course, Steve already said, it's a long time story. We have experience for seven years in the rural region, the coal crisis and steel crisis, so take structural change as a long-term story that it is. We were very lucky to use or even create impulses of change. There were a lot of programs with a lot of money uh, come to the rural, and the most important one for our impact is probably the International Building Exhibition, Iba Emscher Park, because that was the first time in an understanding that attractive landscape is be a good point to start from to attract and incorporate private investment and a new use of the sites. So public money was, is, and still will be needed. You have to prepare the site with public money first, then the private can follow, and the success of the structural change of the rural wouldn't be enough, a different story if there weren't decades of EU funding that made an enormous contribution to the structural change at the Ruhr. That was a very brief rush for our project, and I thank you for your attention. Hand over to Rob, please. Thank you, Ilka. It may have been a very brief presentation, but it was an incredibly rich presentation. So thank you. I was just struck by by taking that longitudinal perspective, like Steve, you know, you've really brought out, you know, the underlying spatial and temporal dynamics and the spatial and temporal challenges of transitions. And I was pleased that you touched on the challenges of multi-actor working and resolving tension, and that it actually takes time and effort to build partnerships, multi-actor partnerships. And it really is something of a dichotomy, a tension and transition. We know we have to move fast, but some of the processes, such as authentic multi-actor working, does take time. It's not like switching on a light. I also thought your point about history was superb. Um, we have to recognise that it's not just the contemporary economy that varies across regions, it's the history of each region varies. And until you do not understand, until you understand and comprehend the history of the region, you cannot actually put in place effective and legitimate policy responses. So Ilka, thank you so much for, for, for a very rich presentation. I'd now like to hand over to Zednik Karazek, who's going to give a, a, a perspective in regard to Moravia Silesia and the Czech, Czech Republic. Now, Zednik is Moravia Silesia's governor's deputy for Restart and Co-Regions in Transition programs. His professional background is related to strategic consultancy, very much focused on development, restructuring, restructuring and transition of regions and cities, and very much taking the perspective of people development and recognising people as assets. Besides uh, strategic consultancy, he's a practitioner experienced in project management, uh, and again, very much focused on the people aspects of restructuring and industrial areas. So, Zednik, uh, delighted you're joining us. So, please, you have the floor. Good morning to everybody. Uh, let me give you regards from our governor, uh, who is uh, today in the Czech Parliament. So, I am here on behalf of him. Uh, let me tell you a few words about the uh, just transition in our Moravian Silesian region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, uh, I must say that uh, for 250 years, uh, we had been uh, the region of uh, hard coal mining and steel production. Uh, and now we are 30 years in the process of uh, transformation. So in comparison with a rural, uh, rural area where there are, they are 70 years, we have uh, 30, first 30 years behind us. Uh, since uh, 2016, we participate in the Czech uh, strategically managed uh, transformation program called Restart. 
which covers uh, three regions, three co-regions, uh, two open mine regions in uh, Bohemia and our region of hard coal mining in Moravia Silesia. Uh, since 2018, we participate in the platform for co-regions in transition and uh, our transformation process and uh, story for the next few years will be uh, managed uh, according to regional development strategy, which was uh, accepted uh, by the uh, regional, the regional government uh, in the last year. Next slide, please. Uh, I must say that uh, for us, the transformation process now is very hot, I can say, uh, because uh, in uh, September uh, this year, the government decided that uh, all coal mines will be closed within uh, uh, one year. It means by the end of the next year, all coal mines will be closed in, in our region. Uh, just to give you a few uh, examples, uh, you can see some, some uh, mines closed in the years 2017, 19, and the rest uh, this and next year. Uh, in uh, the last year, there were about 8,500 employees in the mines. And uh, by the year 2022, there will be just 650 employees. So you can see that uh, it's really a hot, hot topic for us to manage the uh, final phase of, of transformation very successfully. Uh, besides these uh, directly employed people, we have also around 20,000 uh, people in uh, coal mining related uh, firms. Uh, according to, to the Czech law, the coal mining sites will be transferred uh, to the state enterprise Diamo. And uh, in the last months, we uh, set up the working group. Uh, I mean, uh, regional government, uh, municipalities, and this state enterprise. And we will work on uh, transfer of uh, abandoned coal mines to some new economic uh, activities. We will care for people made redundant and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. You can see we have a lot of uh, problems to be solved, uh, like uh, here in this uh, post mining coal sites, uh, and uh, it will need a lot of uh, a lot of investments in the next years. Uh, just few pictures from this uh, from this part of the region. Next slide, please. But uh, as I mentioned, we have been in the process of transformation since 1990, so 30 years, and we can say that currently we are no longer a region of miners uh, because the production of coal uh, dropped down from 16 million of uh, coal. 60 million tons of coal in 2000 to just 4,000 4, uh, or 4 million tons uh, in the last year. Uh, and we can say that uh, the employment uh, or coal mining, uh, coal mining production decreased by 75%. And as you can see, Currently, we have much uh, more people employed in ICT sector and uh, automotive sector. Uh, this automotive sector is very much uh, promoted by the biggest investment of the Korean uh, car producer Hyundai, the biggest investment in the, in the Europe uh, since uh, 10 years. Uh, what is very important as well that we, uh, we are industrial region and I assume similarly to uh, North Rhine and Westphalia, we are we continue to be industrial region and uh, it is now based more on uh, higher uh, added value production. We have a lot of uh, innovations and uh, we have second highest share of companies with technical innovations in the Czech Republic. Next slide, please. What is also very important, we have cleaner air. Uh, the, compared to the year 2008, uh, the amount of solid pollutants decreased by one third. 
and there are some uh, other other numbers which you can you can see uh, in the future we would like to have uh, some new energy sources like uh, hydrogen and uh, electricity from renewable uh, sources next slide please um, i mentioned that uh, last year we agreed uh, we prepared and, and agreed the new regional development strategy uh, and there are two most important indicators for us indicators of change one is uh, stopping the brain drain because there are a lot of uh, people uh, who went out from our region to prague to brno or to, to abroad in the last years we want to stop it and step by step it's uh, being better and we also want to improve our, our image uh, just an example uh, people from uh, prague uh, think that in our metropolis of ostrava there is still uh, coal mining production but it was closed in the year 1994 so uh, the the image is still um, connected with coal with steel which is less and less uh, true uh, we have three main strategic uh, directions uh, of our future development and they are focused on development of business development of uh, people competence and improvement of environment next slide please as i mentioned we are uh, we have been region in transition uh, it is uh, related to the national strategy restart and uh, we also very much use uh, the know-how and sharing of know-how with our friends from uh, platform for co-regions in transition and uh, what are we doing now uh, in this let's say uh, hot years of finalization of this transformation uh, we are preparing for new funding opportunities for us a very important source is just transition mechanism and it's part just transition fund we also expect to use uh, a modernization fund for uh, modernization of uh, of energy sources uh, uh, and we also would like to use other sources like uh, react eu recovery and resilience and so on so we are preparing for this uh, for this process uh, using these funding opportunities next, next slide please uh when we are thinking about using these uh, sources and not just the european but also uh, regional national and private sources we see two main uh, uh, fields for interventions uh, one is uh, let's say competitive part uh, around ostrava metropolis as a growth center there are several uh, excellent centers for example we have uh, one of the best supercomputers in uh, in europe which is also uh, which is also participating in uh, european digital innovation hub uh, hubs network uh, and besides we have also problematic areas like uh, those uh, related to closing of coal mines in the next few months uh, so we must focus our projects also to municipalities in post mining areas uh, municipalities which lose their socio-economic functions and uh, municipalities which have a lot of environmental programs next slide here you can see some successful transformation stories from the past uh, for example, on the left side, uh, upper side, you can see two new uh, faculties, uh, which uh, are just now be built in our metropolis of Ostrava, and they will start uh, operations uh, in 2022. Below uh, so this, uh, there is a former coal and steel site uh, called uh, Lower part of Vitkovice. Uh, this big field was transferred to the third uh, most attractive uh, and most visited uh, attraction in the Czech Republic in the last 10 years. 
there is a lot of companies, there is a lot of museums, uh, science centers, there is a lot of festivals and so on and so on. And uh, for example, on the uh, on the right side uh, below, you can see this uh, supercomputer. So we have a lot of uh, experience, a lot of successes in the last 30 years, and we uh, want and must go further. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned just now, we are preparing ourselves for a just transition plan. And uh, we uh, communicate with all partners in the region. Uh, we uh, know that our absorption capacity is around uh, 120 billion Czech crowns, which is a little more uh, above uh, 4 billion of, of euro. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, distribution of the projects uh, to uh, four areas, uh, entrepreneurship, research, digitalization, 26 percent, energy efficiency, renewable energy, energy and low emission transport, 22 percent, 47 to circular economy and land restoration and uh, employment support, uh, just 5 percent. Uh, but uh, perhaps you know that in the Czech Republic, there is one of the lowest unemployment rates in, in Europe. So. Um, this proportion is not so high, but I must say that currently we are preparing more projects uh, also to this field of uh, employment and education. Next slide, please. Uh, so our priorities, uh, our focus on research, uh, development, uh, innovations, um, people development and so on, they are in line with EU objectives. Uh, Closing of all coal mines in the next few years is also very much in uh, in uh, harmony with Green Deal of Europe. And uh, but we must we we need a lot of investment for this. Uh, with regard to just transition fund, there is an allocation uh, proposed for the Czech Republic on the level of uh, 44 billion Czech crowns, which is around. Uh, Two or one one point something billion of euro, uh, but our need is much much higher. Uh, so we also support the proposal of European Parliament uh, to increase uh, resources of this just transition fund. Uh, we know that it will be difficult, but if at least some increase will happen, it will be very very useful and for us very welcomed. Uh, next slide. I think no. Um, in order to deliver the results to change the region, uh, we use, uh, let's say, a specific asset, intangible asset of our region, which is a, let's say, a little big patriotism and uh, is special amount of cooperation and partnership and trust between stakeholders in the region uh, where the regional government and uh, local governments cooperate very closely and we support this uh, cooperation and this this ecosystem for transformation also through four agencies uh, which are sponsored by by the region, and uh, you can see them on the right side. We have uh, a business and innovation center, we have uh, Moravian Salesian Energy Center, focus on clear energy transition. We have a Moravian Salesian Employment Pact, which is focused on uh, employment and edu education uh, projects, and we have also uh, Moravian Salesian Investment and Development Agency, which is focused on uh, on uh, brown change and so on and so on. Uh, altogether, there are about 200 people working in these agencies and cooperating with uh, all uh, relevant partners in the regions like uh, companies, municipalities, NGOs, and so on and so on. Uh, I must say that uh, in the last years, these partnerships are strengthened. We uh, believe to deliver a very sound uh, and uh, synergic uh, plan for uh, just transition 
uh, transformation. And we believe that uh, within next uh, 10 years, uh, we will definitely uh, transfer this former coal and steel region back to the second most advanced and most uh, powerful, economically powerful pole uh, of development uh, of the Czech Republic. Thank you for your attention. Zegnik, thank you for, for such an excellent presentation about the, the specific nature of transition in Moravia Silesia. Um, and I, I did value the complementarity with your presentation, with the, the previous two presentations and the longitudinal perspective that, that you provided. But I think what, what you said was very powerful. This is a hot topic. You know, there is now an urgency uh, given that the coal mines are closing in the coming months. And so we've been talking about decades of transition, but just due to national policy, EU policy, we're no longer talking about decades of transition. We are talking about transition as a hot topic that is going to be um, progressed within months and years rather than de decades. But I also really valued your insight of looking at transition through a range of lenses, demographic, energy transition, economic diversification, even in terms of regional profile and perspective. So very powerful uh, messages that I I will no that will no doubt fuel the, the questions that we that we will take soon. The final panelist is Dimitri Sikeris, and he is an energy policy officer with WWF Greece. Dimitris is um, has worked in consulting firms in Denmark and Greece, as well as being an advisor for ministries such as the Greek Ministry for Energy and Environment. And as was mentioned earlier, the ministry has recently published a national master plan. He's also worked on energy with energy utilities and is an energy specialist on renewable energy and just transition. So, Dimitris, I really welcome the opportunity uh, for the NGO to give its perspective. So, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very interesting insights so far. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I will start directly and I will try to remain as um, brief as possible. Uh, so I will present uh, our insight um, for the regional transition. Uh, what are the lessons learned and what is um, uh, the Greek case? Um, so next uh, slide, please. So we're working a lot in the um, uh, UK project, European uh, climate Initiative. This project is being funded by the German Ministry of uh, Environment. Um, the duration so far is until the end of next year. Uh, participation, the participants of this uh, project is uh, our four WWF offices, namely Germany, Poland, Bulgaria and Greece. And the main scope of the project is to promote solutions so as to create sustainable jobs in local communities that are based on coal in um, three countries, Greece, Bulgaria and Poland, to in investigate financial instruments to achieve a just transition, establishment of a network uh, between the uh, different member states, and of course, to highlight the importance of a just transition among national governments and institutions. As you can see on the right hand side, um, we are and we have been uh, part of the uh, declaration of uh, mayors and just transition um, uh, initiative. So far, we have more than 60 mayors that have been signing this uh, declaration. Uh, and you can see it's from multiple uh, countries. Uh, next slide, please. So a bit of the state of play uh, about Greece. We had uh, last year in September 2019, the announcement from the prime minister for a complete coal phase out, and that was made more specific a um, few months later. So basically, all existing thermal power plants in Greece will be shut down by 2023. So that basically amounts in a capacity of uh, uh, more than three gigawatts of um, uh, power plants of uh, in, uh, installed capacity. Uh, by 2028, 
uh, we will have the shutdown of the last thermal power plant, which is currently under construction, the Ptolemaida 5. Um, we have a new revised national energy and climate plan that is um, more ambitious in terms of uh, emissions reduction compared to the previous one that uh, the previous government had, uh, has submitted to the um, European Commission. Um, but uh, we have to and we have to um, understand that um, fossil gas uh, has a very, very uh, important role uh, in this plan in replacing coal, which in our opinion is problematic because um, it opens uh, perhaps a new circle of decarbonization um, for uh, the years to come. So, as uh, you mentioned uh, before, um, until the 10th of November, we had the master plan for the lignite regions that was under public uh, consultation. Of course, we took part in this uh, public consultation, uh, but we did some uh, extra work that I will um, uh, refer to um, right after. Next slide, please. So, a few words about what we do uh, in, uh, as part of the Yuki project. Um, of course, we provide advocacy and policy uh, local, for the local uh, communities. We're pushing for a real just transition that is based uh, solely on clean energy sources on the EU and the national level. And uh, we have a long lasting involvement with uh, local communities in the lignite region. The lignite regions in Greece are basically two. It's Western Macedonia and uh, Megalopolis in uh, Peloponnesus. So Greece is responsible for the implementation of the project in Greece. So basically we organize capacity building workshops in Greece. Uh, we produce reports on issues that are related with just transition. We participate. Um, we have organized in the, in the past um, the forum of uh, mayors. It started um, uh, in uh, Kozani in Western Macedonia in 2018, the first forum. Um, and, um, of course, the meet the call platforms. Uh, WWF Greece is uh, responsible also for the communication aspects of this uh, project. So, next slide, please. Uh, a few, um, to, to visualize it a bit more, uh, for the advocacy and the consultation with local communities, it's a very vital process uh, in our um, uh, understanding and in our practice. Uh, we organize field trips to lignite regions. Uh, of course, now due to COVID, uh, we have not been able to uh, do any field trips the last six months. Uh, produce, and we have produced a, a, a series of documentaries called The Suites. Uh, you can find it online about um, the, the coal regions in the um, uh, WWF um, uh, related uh, countries that are part of the project. Uh, we produce policy paper. Uh, papers that um, address the challenges and recommendations. Last one was uh, published in um, uh, February. Uh, dissemination of results and advocacy trips. Uh, this uh, photo on the right hand side is with uh, Executive Vice President Mr. Timmermans and mayors, and um, it, it was on February 2020. And of course, the Forum of Mayors, the last one um, was on uh, 24th of September in 2020. That was um, actually the first time that we did it in a more hybrid form. Um, WWF Poland was responsible uh, for organizing this. Due to COVID, we could not travel. So we basically created national hubs um, and we did so in uh, Kozan in Western Macedonia. Uh, next slide, please. So I will be uh, finishing my presentation with a few words about what we have been done, uh, what we, we have been doing um, and what we have published very, very recently. Um, so basically, uh, I will refer to two um, studies. The first study is about just transition and employment in Greece. Um, but before I go there, I need to give some data about Western Macedonia and Peloponnese. Um, uh, to understand a bit the context and uh, the, the, how this implicates with the uh, just transition process, because we have a, a very fast um, uh, transition process. So in Western Macedonia, the unemployment rate for um, uh, above 15 uh, year old 
people is 25%. That's according to 2019 data. The youth unemployment rate, uh, which refers to the ages 15 to 24, is 53.5%. That's last year's uh, numbers, um, I repeat. And the number of population in poverty risk is 21.6%. Um, the, the, um, the, the same um, uh, data for uh, Peloponne Peloponnese is uh, the unemployment rate is much lower, is 12%. Uh, the youth unemployment rate uh, for the ages 15 to 24 is 34.5%. And the population, the percentage of population in those region, in this region, uh, in poverty risk is uh, almost 20%, 19.7%. Uh, percent. Now about this, um, uh, a few uh, data about uh, this study. So according to the recent study uh, from WWF uh, under the title Just Transition and Employment in Greece, which was published um, on the 10th of November, 2020, we found that 2,200 workers are in direct danger due to coal phase out. That refers to both regions, Western Macedonia and Megalopolis. The main issue regarding the efficacy of the coal phase out is the period 2020 to 2023, as the investments won't uh, be initiated until 2023, which is the closure, the closure, the shutting down of all lignite power plants. Uh, so this process will continue. So if we don't have an adequate uh, safety net right now, another 6,000 jobs are in, uh, in danger due to cascade effect. So we, uh, the multipliers, let's say, due to loss of jobs and income, will uh, be transferred to um, to the uh, regions. Um, some interesting, uh, I hope, data is that for each um, that derive deriving from the study is that for each one euro that is being deducted from lignite activity, 3.1 euros are being deducted from the local economy. The, the, the amount, the, the um, uh, same um, uh, referring to megalopolis is for every one euro, we have 1.7 um, euros deducted from the local economy. We have found, and um, this is something that we expected to found, but we validated that the role of the public power corporation is extremely critical. Uh, it is extremely critical because um, PPC is the main land owner and um, this um, area presents very good growth potential for the regions. That, uh, in, uh, and that's why we are pushing for uh, a higher engagement. Uh, Kozani and Ptolemaida, Eordea, or uh, is the, the other name, have a higher impact uh, in local jobs and income due to uh, the coal phase out. And um, this is something that also Mr. Fothergill uh, mentioned um not all ages are affected in a similar way so what we need is and that what we propose is targeted reskilling of workforce in sectors that present specific characteristics and present also local added value those are decommissioning of lignite power plants circular economy renewables energy efficiency and of course rehab rehabilitation of polluted soil so the proposed governmental just transition development plan, um, I, we cannot really see um, a, 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 an answer um, uh, to the uh, issue. Apologies, Dimitris. Could you yes. could you wrap up in the next minute, please? Thank you. Yes, I'm closing in in, a, in 30 seconds. Sorry. So uh, uh, it, the, the, it fails to answer the issue of the direct impact of the proposed strategy, while it does not really encourage the participation of uh, local communities. This is something that we insist a lot. So this is something what we do in order to uh, promote coordination and cooperation across different actors between public, private and civil society. And I'm closing now. This, we are trying to link this process with the green recovery, we have also recently um, uh, published the blueprint for a green recovery, how to build back better. And uh, the lessons learned are very specific. We need cooperation, we need participation, we need adequate financing tools, and we need a clear vision if we want a process that creates, um, no, that does not create new barriers and does not create new inequalities in order no one to be left behind. Thank you very much. 
Demetrius, thank you for a superb presentation. It is unfortunate the clock is beginning to beat us uh, this morning. Um, but I really did find your um, presentation very enlightening on the critical role of NGOs in engaging communities, but not just engaging communities, but in coordinating across actors, whether they be in the public sector, the private sector, and civil society. And I have got enormous respect through working on our technical assistance program. I've got enormous respect for the work of WWF, but also Bank Watch and Greenpeace, etc. So thanks for that very insightful presentation. Look, I'm, I'm conscious that we're running short of time, but this morning was about the voices from the regions. So it would have been wrong to have closed down the presentations because they were truly the voice from the regions. Um, however, I would like to take some questions now. We have limited time. We have only got about 15 minutes till we wrap up the session. Um, please be aware that questions that are not answered, we will take note of, we will consider in due course. And if there are questions to specific panelists or contributors, we will hand on these questions. I see that we have got a number of questions um, in regard to the. Hold on. I'd quite like to see the questions, the later questions, if possible. I think what we'll do is we will start with uh, one question, uh, which seems to summarize many of the questions that we have to date. And this is to all the panelists. Um, from your experience, how do you promote coordination and cooperation across different actors in the public, private, and civil society to enable transition? We've heard about how transition is predicated on multi actor cooperation. So, I'll just go through the, the speakers uh, as the panelists as they presented. Steve, would you like to give your thoughts on that? Yes, very quickly. Um, there's got to be a willingness to cooperate. Um, uh, I know in the UK context that uh, willingness to cooperate hasn't always existed. Um, there's often been quite antagonistic um, uh, relationships. Um, I think it, if the scale of the problem is large, the crucial player that really needs to be involved, certainly has needed to be involved in the UK, is actually the, the central government, the UK government uh, itself. And probably the, uh, the biggest single step forward um, in the time that I've been involved with coalfield regeneration uh, in Britain was the establishment in the late 1980s of um, a coalfields task force to really review the state of play and to try to uh, look at what all the players at local, um, regional and national government uh, needed to be doing. Um, but the, the willingness to cooperate is the, um, is, is the first ingredient. Thank you. Thank you. Ilka, would you like to just comment on that question in regard to coordination across actors? Uh, yeah, thank you. In the side, which is my focus on, it's always the question of how and of what, and it's always about side, people, money, and time, and you have to organize the process. Um, in our experience, it is make them concerned. Make them concerned and creating partnership by convincing ideas everyone could take his benefits from and we do information transparently and activating and dialogue orientating and yes we are trying to give the people um, responsibilities so um, convincing in the meaning of individual and telemate solutions very um, selected precisely maybe just the, for the moment thank you Ilka uh, Zednik any thoughts Hello, Zetanek. Any comments on the question? Uh, in this question uh, about trilateral yeah. cooperation? Yes. In, 
in regard to the question was about cooperation across different actors. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, we have a specific implementation structure uh, in which we have six uh, working groups focused on uh, different uh, different uh, areas like employment and so on. And there are there are experts, uh, and these experts uh, during the entrepreneurial discovery process they identify some uh, project ideas, uh, transformation project ideas. And then these projects uh, go through several other steps. And uh, on the strategic level, they are uh, presented and either approved or rejected by a so-called tripartite. Uh, it means, uh, you know, employers, uh, regional government, government and uh, employees or trade unions. So uh, this is one body. Another body is we call uh, we call it a, re a regional uh, a regional permanent conference. Uh, there are twenty one uh, representatives of different institutions, and this is the level of uh, strategic level which uh, decides about uh, which projects uh, will be uh, will be accepted and further developed. Uh, with regard to uh, changing the region uh, closer to climate neutrality and all the other aspects related to this. Thank you, Zedanik. Uh, Dimitris, any views on a uh, promoting cooperation between different actor groups? Obviously, you have some experience of that. Yes, uh, of course, this is the main idea. Uh, that was my closer as well. Um, we cannot do otherwise. I mean, we need to uh, cooperate. We need to discuss. We need uh, different processes, bottom up. So uh, the, the issue of uh, cooperation between different stakeholders in order to create an inclusive and participatory process is uh, something extremely important. Uh, if I may, because I had a question perhaps I, um, I, in the way I was speaking, perhaps there was a, some kind of interpretation. Uh, we, we do not support creating sustainable jobs based on coal. Uh, the coal mines are closing down, so we support a just transition that does not create new issues of transition, for instance, with fossil gas in the next decade. So we are talking about a clean energy and just uh, transition. Thank you, Dimitris. That, that answers that first question on the top of our screen. I would actually like to go to the question. We will come back on the trilateral cooperation question in a moment, and I'll address that, obviously, to Carol and Katya. But in terms of the, the question at the bottom, we've touched on the question of creating sustainable employment for coal miners, um, only for coal miners, but for the, the future generations within their coal mining communities. But I would just like to ask the panel, what is their view and how do we create a, opportunities for coal miners for employment in the very short term? As, um, as Zedanek referenced and yourself, Dimitris, this is a hot topic. Employment needs to be created in the short term. So I would like to ask the panel their views on how do you create a, opportunities, employment opportunities for miners in the short term. And again, if we could start with uh, Steve. As I think I, I tried to say in my presentation, the, the fundamental problem in the mining areas is actually not what you do with the the, um, the redundant miners. It's what, what, what employment opportunities you create for the, for the generations um, behind them. But in practice, um, the UK experience does um, suggest that um, uh, some of the miners do actually leave the industry with, with skills that can be applied in other industries. There are people you know, who are trained as electricians in the mines and they can apply their, their skills as an electrician in, in, in other contexts. Uh, there's also quite a lot of miners who've um, uh, you know, been able to move across into the construction industry um uh for for example um 
But, you know, re really, we sh I don't think we should be looking just for, you know, short term job creation. I mean, the fundamental problem in here is is long term sustainable job creation for the generations behind the miners, because the miners themselves, after a number of years, do drop out of the labour market. Um, the, the big sources of new jobs in, in many of the former mining areas um, have um, been warehousing and distribution, uh, call centres, interestingly, which has been a big source of employment, not just for, for men, but also um, women. Um, and the public sector has, uh, has expanded in employment uh, substantially. Um, so once again, I, I think if you're looking for a, you know a single silver bullet, it doesn't exist. You you know the the job creation process um, you know involves lots of different aspects and many people with many different sort of skills and problems. Um, you know, don't look for 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 a single silver bullet. Apologies, Ilka. Any thoughts in regard to that top question, how to use the skills of coal miners and in which sectors? Of course, for me, that it's hard to answer because that change um, happened since the late 50s. So the region uh, implemented university, universities and colleges so um, to compensate. But also, of course, um, the public sector raises up and still the region is a very industrialized region. So the strategy, the, not the, I'm sorry, the, um, the tradition uh, of um, blue workers jobs are still there. So that's for the moment. Thank you, Elka. Zednik, would you like to comment on the highlighted question? Yes. Uh... I must say that for us, a uh, much bigger problem than closing the mines and uh, redundancies uh, is pandemia, because if uh, it will finish, uh, there is a hunger for new employees in our region. So we think, uh, and we know uh, that a part of uh, coal miners made redundant will be outplayed or replaced to the new uh, companies or to existing companies. Um, other coal miners will be employed in the state company which will work uh, on uh, land reclamation after the coal mining closures. Uh, and uh, what is also important, the question about sector, uh, because uh, you know that coal mining uh, is a relatively well-paid sector. And if we want to replace uh, thousands of well-paid jobs, uh, we must find uh, another sector. And for us, it's energy sector. So uh, in the last two, three years, and in the next 10 years, we expect to become the most uh, developed region in the Czech Republic with, re with regard to the new energy sources. And we believe that a lot of uh, uh, former coal miners will be employed there. And the last, uh, maybe just anecdotal example, is uh, uh, from the festival of uh, documentary movies uh, this year. And there was a winning movie about the former coal miner in the, let's say, lower middle age, which was uh, requalified to uh, IT programmer successfully. Of course, it's an example, it's a specific example, uh, but uh, it's quite a good, uh, let's say, example that even such things happens in life. A, a very interesting analogy to to, to finish on, an uh, anecdote to finish on. Uh, Dimitris, uh, I know you've commented uh, partly on the whole question of employment in and post coal mine employment. Is there anything you wish to add to the highlighted question? Yeah, the only thing is that we need to understand that um, coal mining activity, and that refers to Greece because we have different different um, uh, pace in, in in regards to the just transition 
um, process in different member states or different countries. What I, I we can say that in Greece uh, we had a steady process of um, uh, of, the, of this phase out the, the past uh, decade. Uh, so the coal mines had a reduced activity the past years. Right now we need to be very direct, and the sectors that we have highlighted are um, renewables. They, they, they are the soil rehabilitation, and especially this one. Um, uh, we try to identify the activities that match the skills of uh, existing workforce in the coal mines or in related activities in the coal regions. So what we need to do is to assess the, the current skills. We need to find the, the, the activities that could uh, at the moment uh, directly stop unemployment uh, to rise in order not to activate the further um, uh, impact to the rest of the local uh, communities. So we have very, very specific uh, recommendations and you will be able to uh, have a look. We are translating it in English, so everybody will be able to go through this in a very, very detailed manner uh, for, for the sectors and what is the impact of, for each sector uh, in our analysis. Thank you for that very uh, practical and detailed response, Dimitris. I, I noticed that there has been a lot of interest that generated from the discussion about the trilateral cooperation. And although time is short, I would like to uh, ask um, Carol if he could just respond to the two questions just in passing, if possible, to keep it very brief. Carol, would you be co comfortable just responding to these two questions collectively? Robert, to be honest, I have now some connection problems. I lost the connection or, uh, or not. No, no problem. I'm just saying that there's a, been a lot of interest in your trilateral cooperation program. And we have two questions on our screen. Uh, and I, I can you view the questions? How does the trilateral cooperation on transition toward climate neutrality yeah. work, given the different coal phase out timelines? of the three countries. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and also the next steps for the uh, trilateral cooperation. If you could try and summarize it in one minute, it would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Regarding uh, the climate neutrality, I think that uh, I can say that uh, the aims uh, to 2030 is uh, based on local and uh, let's say some project-based agreement uh, and in line with the regional strategies. Uh, and uh, let's say for now, in Czech Republic, and I think the same is in uh, Germany and Poland, uh, uh, it's a matter of further neg negotiating how to how to align them with the national strategies. Yeah, but uh, to be honest, I'm not the one, uh, the really expert for the for the let's say emission goals. So maybe maybe someone other could be uh, of different opinion. Uh, nevertheless, uh, through the slide, I have tried to answer all the questions which which has uh, been headed to me. So. Robert, I think that uh, I should I should close it for now from my side. Thank you, Katja. Do you just have any last minute reflections in regard to what are the next steps, are the next necessary steps to realize the project in its entirety? Uh, yes, thank you, Robert, uh, and thank you, Carol. Uh, I just uh, tried to answer briefly uh, the Slido uh, questions as well uh, due to time issues. And uh, the reply I gave to this uh, uh, question is like uh, we, the uh, most important next step is to find a fitting uh, EU program for this uh, big pilot project and uh, also answer the question if there are programs to combine. So there will be a deep discussion uh, the next uh, time and uh, to highlight that this is a, a real um, European project uh, and we will move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you, Katja, for your excellent brevity Maybe. and masterclass in Maybe. summary. Um, I think, unfortunately, due to time, <clears throat> we will have to conclude today's session. but.
I think what struck me as, as the moderator was that the recurring identification of common challenges, but challenges that have solutions that go across uh, European Union regions. And Professor Fothergill, Steve Fothergill is right to say that it's difficult to just transfer policy and, <clears throat> policy and practice solutions. However, there is a real appetite for sharing of knowledge. And I actually think this idea of an Erasmus for co-regions has a great sense of legitimacy and momentum. And so this is something that we really have to embark on. This is a journey that is worth uh, taking forward. I also felt that we had clear messages about the need for integrated solutions and the need to think in a systems fashion and recognizing that solutions, there are no one silver bullet for transition, but there is a, a menu of activities and responses that have to be implemented. But I think my big takeaway from today is that looking forward, 2021 is going to be a critical year for coal regions, peat regions, and shale oil regions in Europe. And so the initiative has, to, has a very demanding agenda in the coming year. <clears throat> but as demonstrated, we have moved quickly as an initiative over the last couple of years. But 2021 is going to be a critical year of change in coal regions. And so it has to be a critical year for the coal regions in transition initiative. Once again, I'm very sorry that we've been beaten by the clock, but I would like to thank the panelists for their incredible insights and their very um, lucid and honest insights on the opportunities and challenges of transition. And I'd like to thank you, the participants, for your questions. We've had a very rich uh, range of questions submitted. And as I said, we will uh, reflect on the questions that have not been answered today. And if there are specific questions to specific panelists, we will make sure that they are communicated. My final thank you is to the organizers of today, Elisa, Roberto, Leila, and Philip. Without them, today would have probably been a disaster, but they have put in the hours over the last few weeks to ensure that we've had a terrific session today, but also throughout uh, the week, the sessions have been incredibly well run, professional, and a very rewarding and enriching experience for all the participants. So it is just to say thank you for participating. We look forward to reconnecting in 2021. And hopefully sometime in 2021, we will meet in a, a physical place once again as a community face to face. But until then, please do stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to working and cooperating with you in the future. Thank you.